a senior for the year. So let me, since the beginning of the year, so let me welcome each and every one of you and let me wish you a happy and prosperous new year. Ma'am, you know, Drew said um, that this year is his year. I don't know about you. Is this year going to be your year? I know this year is God's year. And for all of us, we should, our aim should be to make this year our year. You know, last year passed. I give God thanks that um, for all of us, I can look in the room and I look around and I see all the familiar faces. You know, because the sad thing was that there are a lot of people who did not make it through 2014. You know, listen to the news. There was actually someone who died December 31st. And as sad, did not make it to see the new year. And there are others who woke up in the new year in hospital. Or can't move, or different things. But we are here today, amen? Yes. And I'm excited because I'm healthy, thank God. The voices are right this time around, so you can hear me. And I can say what I have to say. But, you know, sometimes we have friends, don't we? And sometimes we have some friends that, we, we, we call them our friends, but sometimes they do some things, I say some things that we should strangle them afterwards, don't we? But there are three friends that I know of. Uh, these three friends, uh, they, it was a blonde, a redhead, and a brunette. All three of them went, they went off on a trip. They went to the, des the desert and they got lost in the desert. And while we were there, they found they found a lamp. And they began to rub the lamp. And a, whoop, a genie appeared. So the genie said, I'll grant each of you one wish. Of course, the redhead in the desert, lost. He said, man, I wish I was home in my bed. I wish I was home. Whoop! And the brunette said, man, I wish I was home with my family, in the comfort of my home. He went home. Blonde was left alone, and she looked around and said, ah, I wish my friends were here. <laughs> Careful your friends are. <laughs> but amen. Anyway, we have great friends here, and I'm glad that we're all here. Amen. amen. Worshiping God this morning. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we are so grateful for another day. Thank you so much for another Sunday when we can come together as friends, as family, God, to worship you, to give you honor, to give you glory. Father, I'm ready just the, the singing, just the uh, union lesson, a contribution lesson, uh, the announcement, everything so far, God, has been, I hope, God, to you, a fragrance, a sweet smell and aroma to your nostrils. I pray that everything that we've done so far, continue to do, would be praised to you, would be glorified, would really, really continue to lift up your holy name. Thank you so much for just voices to sing. And Father, just minds to think about the words that we sing, how great is our God. And Father, just to know that you are indeed our great and awesome God. Father, we thank you so much for bringing us here uh, uh, this morning. We're going to take this time out to worship you and listen to your words. And I speak, pray, God, that as I share your words, God, that each and every one of us here will hear exactly what you want us to hear. And that, Father, our hearts will be moved to serve you even more. And we will commit to you. Father, thank you so much for being with us through. 2014 and have brought us into 2015. I pray that as we look forward to the year, that we will build and build this song. Father, we love you, we thank you. We're in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, the title of my message this morning is um, How Will You Build in 2015? You know, my family and I, we had the opportunity to spend the new year in Elutra. Uh, we weren't here, we went to Elutra. I you know it's a family tradition that has been going on for the last about oh, 20 years now. That every Christmas, <laughs> somebody said more than that. We, we've been married for 23 years, and we've been, I've been coming here to the Bahamas for the last 23 years before we moved here permanently. And almost every Christmas, every New Year, for the last 20, not the full 23, about 20 years, we go over to Eleuthera. 
You know, one of my pastimes that I do for is um, to go fishing. I love fishing. And uh, every year when I go over to the little truck, I, I, I normally go off and do my little fishing off the rocks or if his uncle is available and he has, he has a boat, then sometimes he takes us out. But you know, every year between my family household and my in-laws, we normally have about 11 people. And every year my mother-in-law would factor in at least two dinners from the fish I would catch during my time there. And we feed all the people at least twice well, the time the week or so that we're in here. And sometimes we I didn't have extra to bring back to Nassau. You know, this year, and for the last couple of years, I don't know, maybe too much fishing been going on in the waters of the Bahamas. For the last two years or so, boy, fishing has been busy. You know, this year wasn't any different. It was really, really bad. I spent more time probably at home uh, watching movies with the family than normal. Because normally I get up 4 o'clock, 4.30 in the morning, go out fishing, and then come back in about 10, 11, and by that time, there's the family from just be waking up at that time. They'll be up at 10 o'clock. But um, this year, the fishing wasn't very good. And so what I decided to do was to travel around in, in, in Luther, in our near neighborhood, north of Luther, going down to, to uh, Burger Town, and going down trying to find a decent fishing spot. In one of my journeys, I came across, I went to Rainbow, called Rainbow Bay, in the Lutheran. And on one of my journeys, I came across, and everybody keep looking at the thing on the wall, right? On one of my journeys, I came across this ruin. It was a remain of a building that was constructed. We have to do the other slide. All right, that's the foundation of what was left of a building that was constructed. Now, when I looked at the foundation, flip back to the other one. When I passed this, this ruin, it grabbed my eye. You know, because I'm in the construction business, I'm a land surveyor. And I was looking at these footings of this foundation. And I was impressed with the construction of the foundations that I saw. Because I looked at the shape, I looked at the structures that were there, and I, I looked at it and I realized that this has been through many hurricanes, many storms. And the foundation pillars were still there. And the thing that hit me is that the person who constructed this building obviously spent a lot of time making sure that the foundation was right. Because the foundation was really solid. You know, when I went, as I was traveling, I met the maintenance manager for Rainbow Bay. I began to strike up a conversation with him about the foundation and about what I saw. And I you know, began to express to him how interesting those foundations and columns were and that they're still standing. And he went and he gave me the history of the building. What I was some time ago, this guy from the United States came down with his engineering. And um, he did spend a lot of time, the guy said, making sure that the foundation and the footing was right. And then he went up and built what at that time was a very elaborate building. It was beautiful, he said. It was a building that was steel frame and he used foam to build the walls. And so it was one of those foam type buildings. <laughs> Just steel frames. And so he built, and the building was nice and it was elaborate. And I looked at it and I said, wow, you know. And I looked at that foundation and I realized that this man spent a lot of time. And the interesting thing also that he told me is that the guy who originally started building that building, he died. And um, two other gentlemen took over and they started to rebuild on top of the foundation that was there, the white part that you saw on that side. They started deciding that they're going to start building with block and steel and coming up. And it so happened that they also died in the crash. And so the building is left there, right where it's at, with those foundations, with those footings that you saw. And you know, this foundation is going to form the basis of my lesson. Am I 
as I said, the topic is, how will you build in 2015? I want you to turn your Bibles with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I'm going to share the insight that I believe God gave me when I looked at this book. And when I spent time looking at this foundation. You know, God really, I, I was there, you know, because one other thing when I'm traveling and fishing is that it helps me to meditate on God. I spend time just thinking about God's creation. You know, I, I, I love God's creation. And it reminds me of just how powerful God is. You know, on, on the couple of Saturdays, we started um, meeting by the beach by St. Andrews. And I go there on a Saturday morning just to spend time with them. Just to pray. First time I went there, a couple of the brothers uh, joined me there. But um, I, was, I had a good hour and a half there this Saturday. I was so meditating. <laughs> but it was awesome. I just hope God is <laughs> Amen, brothers. But you know, today I want to talk about um, how will you build? And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're going to read from verse 10. It says, You there? So, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Christ Jesus. If anyone builds on the, this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straws, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be tested with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survive, he will receive his reward. If it is burnt up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. You know, in verse 11, Paul says, No one can lay any other foundation than the one already laid. Is Christ Jesus. You know, as a church, if you're a believer, you have made Jesus Lord of your life. If you're somebody who declared Jesus and you became a disciple of Jesus based on the scriptures, you've already laid that foundation. And today I want to share two major points. And the first one is Building a solid foundation. I want to share with you just what it means to build a solid foundation. What to build your foundation on Jesus, as the scripture says, as Paul said. And so in building this, this foundation, I like this guy, he spent great time building his foundation, making sure that it was right. And for us, for us to be able to build, we've got to make sure that the foundation we got to make sure that your foundation is built on Jesus Christ, as Paul said. And so the, one of the first things that we need to do in building this foundation and ensuring that we have a solid foundation is, as the scripture says in Romans 10 and verse 17, you can turn here with me, Romans 10 and verse 17, it says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. You see, in order for us to build a foundation, we got to hear the message. you got to listen to the message that Jesus is trying to say to each and every one of us. You know, the thing, interesting thing is, there's a lot of messages that is being said out there. You turn your television on, you see all the, the, the tents put up, all the fancy buildings put up. There are a lot of messages. But you know what the scripture says here? It says, consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of God. There are a lot of messages out there, people. Brothers and sisters, there's a lot of messages. But are those messages coming from the word of God? You see, a lot of people say a lot of things. But we need to be able to hear the message. But not only hear the message, 
will make sure that the messages that we are listening to is from the Word of God. A lot of people say some fancy thing. You know what? I, I saw this um, thing that somebody did, was on Facebook where this guy was going around and he was what, slewing in the people in the spirit. And people are, I'm thinking, man, really? Where did I ever see that in the scriptures? I didn't see Jesus do that. I didn't hear Paul do that. I didn't see it written in any of the, 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 the epistles where Paul is saying, I can throw the spirit. As far as I know, the only part, time that the spirit is given is through God himself at the point of baptism and in those days through the laying on of the apostles' hand. I never see in the scripture talk about throwing the spirit. You take the spirit. <laughs> you know, and so there are messages going on there, people. We've got to be like the Bereans in Acts. That even when Paul came and preached the word to them, they didn't just accept, they heard the message and accepted the message. But the scripture says they were of noble character because they went and examined the scriptures for themselves and made sure that the conviction that they were following was based on the word of God. A lot of us are following messages. Even as disciples, we're following messages because it sounds good. The Bible tells us that broad is the road that leads to destruction. But narrow is the road that leads to life, but only a few will find it. The broad road is nice. It's pretty. You know all these new, new roads that were built in, the, in, in Nassau? Boy, I like, I drive on those nice roads and get to head to work. Before, we, I live out this. But before the roads were done, in the mornings, I normally leave home like sometimes 6.30. I have to leave by 6.30. By 7 o'clock, 6.30 to 7 o'clock, the traffic is blocked up from uh, Fox Hill stoplight past Sea Grip where I live up the road. So normally I have to leave home extremely early. And then what used to happen is, sometimes to avoid the traffic, man, I have to turn through some back roads and all kinds of stuff to get here. But now that the road is fixed, I can drive down this road and it's nice. So the broad road is nice, people. And so a lot of people will follow the broad road. But God doesn't want us to do that. God wants us to follow His way. And His way in building the foundation is to hear the word of God. To hear the message. And the message must be based on God's word. Not on any man coming and jumping and saying all kinds of things and being nice. And even, you know, say the nice words. Just believe it. It's all nice and good. All is good. All is well. And, and even the one that talks about the prosperity. You drop it, give your contribution. And God will bless you. Yeah, God will bless you. But that's not the reason why we do the things. We do, just to get material blessing. Because the material blessings that we receive in this life is going to pass. Mm -hmm. So enjoy the blessings that God gives you. If God gives you a house out west, enjoy it. Don't feel guilty. But that should not be what you're striving for. That should not be your aim. That should not be your goal. That should not be the thing that possessed you. Your, what should possess you is to build in this solid foundation that God wants us to build on Jesus Christ. And in order to build that, you've got to hear the message. You've got to have faith. You've got to believe this message. And you must have faith. In, um, in John 5 and verse 39, because just hearing the message and believing the message alone is not enough. You've got in John 5 and verse 39. I want you to turn there because this is important. Because we study the Bible with people. And a lot of people out there in the world say they study the Bible as well. Some of them know the Bible more than all of us inside of this room. There are people out there who can quote scriptures. But the thing is... Jesus says here in verse 39 and 40. He says, You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me, but yet you refuse to come to me to have life. You see, it's good to study the word of God, but if in your studies it's not helping you to get closer to God, getting you to understand and come into a deep relationship with God, then you are diligently studying the scriptures. And that's about it. You know, when we study the Bible with people to help them to come into an understanding of what God expects from them, it's not just about opening the scriptures and studying. It's not a class. 
You know what I mean? It's about helping you to understand and to come into a deeper relationship with Jesus. Brothers and sisters, let me ask you this. When you are studying your Bible, when you are spending time with God, is it moving you to know Jesus? Or are you just going through the motion of a Bible study? It's just the same as studying a textbook. You know, the people who go to seminaries and, and, and all these um, get their degree. You have people who study the Bible and they know it. They know the history of it. They could tell you where everything comes in the chronological alignment. But yet, they don't know Jesus. They don't know the God behind the Bible. Church, if you're going to build, you have got to know the God behind your Bible. You gotta study it. You gotta believe it. But most importantly, you gotta know Jesus and realize that what you're doing is because of that relationship with Jesus, and not just a study. And you know, as we study the Bible with people, brothers and sisters, I don't want us to be like, oh yeah, oh it's just another study. No, it's not another study. It's helping the person, your friend that you're studying with, to come into an understanding of Jesus. You know, we have a study series, and sometimes I hear this, I say, oh, it's just a study series. It's not just a study series. If that's what you think it is, and that's your approach, it's like what Jesus says here. If studying the Bible, and you diligently study the Bible, if that's all you're going to be doing. But if you understand that the reason we study the Bible with people, we study the Bible with our friends, is to help them to come into an understanding of who Jesus is and what God wants for their lives. It's helping them to build this foundation and making sure that it is solid. You know, having heard, having believed, having come in, gain an understanding of your relationship with Jesus, then you gotta repent. You gotta turn. You gotta change. Because you cannot study God's word and know Jesus and remain the way that you are. But once you come in contact with Jesus, there must be a change. You know, the apostles, when, when, the, when the, 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 the council was, at, uh, was, was, was trying them, they looked and they said, these men were ordinary, unschooled men. But the Bible tells us that they took note that these men were with Jesus. And you know, when we study the Bible and come into that contact with Jesus, if you remain the same, you're missing it. You need to stop and think and make sure that you're getting it. Because when you get it, you want to repent. You want to change. You want to have a transformation of the way that you used to live. So if you're going one way, being a liar, being deceitful, being immoral, doing the things that is contrary to God, or even being religious, where you're just following religious customs and traditions. But when you meet Jesus, when you come in contact with Jesus, your life should change. You want to walk like Jesus did. You want to be like Jesus. And that's the kind of impact that the Word of God will have on our lives when, when we come in contact with Jesus. You know, when you just made that decision to repent, this is we're building this foundation. It's a solid foundation. And so, you know, like the guy building that foundation, he had to dig deep, he had to form up, he had to put all those steel in and all those concrete in and get that foundation solid. This is what we're building as disciples. And as we help people. Because you got to hear it. you got to uh, you got to hear, hear the message. you got to believe it. you got to repent. Then you got to make Jesus Lord of your life. You know, in, he, in, the, uh, uh, yes. in Romans chapter 1. We're not going to go to Romans as yet. But in Hebrew it talks about. You gotta hear the word. You gotta believe in your heart. And you gotta confess that Jesus to be Lord of your life. That's Romans 10. Sorry, Romans 10. I'm gonna read from verse 9. Because in order for you to have that transformation that God wants you to have, you gotta believe. You gotta hear the word. And in Romans 10 and verse 9, it says. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and be and are saved. You see, you have to believe. Because if you don't believe, you're not going to repent. 
If you don't believe, you're not going to follow what God wants you to do. You're not going to follow Jesus. You're not going to do what Jesus wants you to do. You're not going to believe that when you study the word and you come in contact with Jesus and you understand what Jesus wants for your life, you won't be able to change if you don't believe. You know, if you didn't believe that the chair that you're sitting on could hold your weight, you would not have sat down on it. How many of you in here, when you came in, you check those chairs, you shake it, you make sure that the legs were solid, you, 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 you make sure that the, the, the bottom of the chair was fixed on. How many of you did that? Yeah. Because you believe in the chair. You believe that when you sit in it, it will hold your way. In order to follow Jesus, you've got to believe. In order to be saved, you must believe. But more importantly, you have to also confess Jesus to the Lord. You have to make Jesus Lord of your life. You know, Jesus says that if you're going to follow him, you have to surrender. You have to give up everything you have to follow him. And so Jesus has to become Lord of your life if you're going to build a solid foundation. And then in Romans chapter 6, Verse 1. Before you even go there, I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 2, 30. So Mark, and put your fingers in Romans 6, 1, and then turn to Acts 2, 38. This is a familiar scripture to a lot of us. I want us to read it. I want us to go back there. Because we're going to build this foundation. We're building in 2015. We're going to make sure that we're building solid. We're going to make sure that as we build, for, you not, for us to build the superstructure, if you're in construction, the superstructure is the concrete walls and coming up. For you to build a, a solid superstructure, you got to have a solid foundation. And in Acts 2.38, it says, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of God's Holy Spirit. So you got to hear, you got to believe, you got to repent, you got to confess Jesus to be Lord. You have to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and to receive God's Holy Spirit. Then you would have built a solid foundation. You know, when I looked at that foundation, I realized that for years that foundation stood there, stood solid. And what Peter, Paul said was that he built on this foundation. And whatever we build above the foundation will be tested. But the foundation still remains. You know, for us as a church, and as disciples, I believe the foundation that we're building on, which is the Word of God, and, 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 and coming into an understanding of a relationship with God, is solid. What I just outlined to you in becoming a disciple, that's the Word of God. There are many people who say otherwise. Just say a prayer. Just believe. Touch the television screen and you're saved. I didn't see that in the Bible. Jesus says, you got to hear. Paul, Peter got up and said, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. You know, I often says in Romans chapter 6, and let's look at it. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer. Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We are therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live and be life. This is us. And this was Christ. You hear me say this analogy all the time? But the foundation don't change. These things that I'm saying to you, many of you have heard it, but some of you are still doubting. And we talk about that a little bit more as I go on. Some of you have not developed a conviction about the foundation that you have laid in Jesus Christ. And so some of you are still even wondering, oh, do I need to be baptized? Do I need to hear the word? Do I need to, to be saved? Yes, you do. That's what the scripture says. You know, this is, I always look at this analogy, this scripture here. It says, Jesus took our sins on the cross. Yes? And I say to you, and I hope you remember it. 
But when Jesus took on our sins, what happened to him? He got separated from God. The Bible says Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God had to forsake Jesus because he took our sins on him on the cross. But we read the scripture that when Jesus died, was buried, and was resurrected, what happened to Jesus after that? He was resurrected, he was able to go back to his father. That God who had to abandon him. Having died, buried, and was resurrected, Jesus was able to go back to him. Why? Because somewhere between him on the cross with our sins, to when he was resurrected again, it meant that those sins were gone. Romans says it quite clearly here. This is us in our sinful state. We hear the word, we repent, we believe, we confess, we know that we're in a sinful state. We're separated from God. The Bible tells us when we participate in the waters of baptism and come back up, we come up like Jesus. So somewhere between here to when we go down in the waters of baptism to come back to be here, the Bible says we are raised to newness of life. Now let me ask you this. Some people say it's your prayer and you're saved. If by saying a prayer... I am saved and my sins are all forgiven. Then why would I need to go through this to come up here? If all I said when I said that prayer, my sins have been forgiven. If all that it meant, why did Jesus have to go through that to go back to the Father? Think about it, people. And sometimes we question that. You see, we are here with our sins. You gotta hear the word, you gotta believe. You gotta believe that when you participate, as Peter said here, in baptism and rise, and Paul says here, and Peter said in Acts, is that you're rising to the newness. That is when, at the point through your faith, you participate in the death, in the shed blood of Jesus, and you're raised to newness of life. That is what builds that foundation. And that message will never change. And as a church, that's what we believe, that's what we see. And that's what we need to stand firm on. And if our foundation is weak, what can you build? You, some of us wonder, why is it that I'm struggling? And you're talking about suffering. That's not suffering. That's struggle. Suffering is when you are determined to do what is right. Because when you look at Jesus suffering, what does Jesus suffer? Jesus suffered because he refused to give in to sin. Some of us are giving in to sin and we say we're suffering. That's not suffering. You cheat on the job and you get fired and you say, oh, I'm suffering. What <laughs> suffering? suffering is that? No, I'm suffering like Jesus. Jesus didn't suffer because of sin. Jesus suffered because he refused to sin. You know your suffering should be? When you're tempted, and you're Jew, you was praying about it, girl, you got to be careful what you pray for. You pray that God will shut your eyes and you get blind. What do you need to pray for? Is that Jews, Jews, Jews praying for for, for purity. He's praying to keep his eyes pure. You know what is suffering? When you're tempted to lust, when you're tempted to turn on that computer, and that desire is burning you to do it, and you say, no, I'm not going to do it. When that man at work comes on to you, and he starts to tell you, oh, just come out to me and I'll buy your new car. I pay for your apartment. You're in debt, I pay for your rent. Don't worry, I'll take care of you. And you know that you're in need. You know that your job not paying your bills. But you are determined to suffer through that to remain righteous. That's suffering like Jesus. And that's the kind of suffering that we need to go through. You know, we talk about the sufferings. You've got to understand what suffering is. And as we build, unless you build, unless you stand firm, your foundation is weak. And a lot of times we because our foundation is weak and we're dull minded in what we think. That is why we try to build. Oh, I try to be righteous. How can you be righteous when you don't even sure if you're saved? The foundation is shaking. The Bible tells us, and look at it, it's a double minded man is unstable in all he does. If you're not sure, you're building on something that is doing this. And you want to be, I want to be a leader in God's kingdom. 
But then as soon as any little thing starts, the foundation starts to wobble. Why? Because it's still doubting. You know, you're sharing your faith and, you, and, and you're tempted and, 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 and some of the situations that I hear of, people are, are, are being distracted by the outside, looking for relationships on the outside. And you wonder, oh, that person is a Christian because they go to church. Not everybody who goes to church is a Christian. You've got to be able to, to stand on the Word of God. And if you're not standing on this, and what I just said and showed you from the Scriptures, how can you say that they are, they're Christian? You're going to be standing firm, people. If we're not standing firm, we'll fall. If you're not standing firm, that is what is going to happen. Put that picture back up. Uh, I want that picture to remain here. You know, you got to build a solid foundation. You got to ensure that your foundation is solid delay. Having built and making sure that your foundation is solid, then you're going to build on that solid foundation. You know, some of us here, we are at different stages in our spiritual walk. Some of you are still, as I said earlier, you're still wavering. Your foundation is not solid. You need to stop, examine where you're at, and make sure that your foundation is solid. Because you cannot build if your foundation is solid. If you're not sure that you're a Christian, how can you walk a Christian? You know, an analogy that I always use when I'm studying the Bible with my friends is, and some of you might have heard it before, is that if I want to go to college, I'm sure you're here. But I'll say it again. I go to college. I want to be a college student. I want to go to school. And so I decide that I'm just going to go on the campus and I'm going to just start going to classes and be a COB student. And I started to go to all the classes, never miss a lecture, carry my bags and my books, and I'm walking around campus as a campus student. And I'm at college because I, I'm doing the things that a college student does. And so I should be accepted as college student, yes? No. At the end of my three years, will I be able to get a diploma or a degree? No. Why? I didn't fulfill the entry requirement. And it's the same thing with being a disciple. Some of us trying to build, but we don't have a foundation. We want to be Christians, and we want to walk and look like and dress like a Christian, whatever that is, but we don't have a foundation. Even as disciples, guys, as I said, we want to build. And all of us want to build. But unless your foundation is solid, what you're going to build is going to fall. You know the parable that Jesus talked about, building on rock and building in the sand? If your rock foundation is not in the rock, it's going to fall. And a lot of times we fall because our foundations are not built properly. And so I want to encourage us as brothers and sisters. And if you're visiting with us, examine where you're at. Examine where your foundation is. Get in the scriptures. See what it says. Understand how to build. And let us build together. Church, our foundation is solid. Let us get a conviction and begin to build. I believe that God wants us, not only in this year, but going forward, to become that enormous, and I'm not just talking about numbers, I'm talking about spiritual maturity, I'm talking about disciples who are loving, disciples who are doing awesome, disciples who are consistent in coming out to church, disciples who are consistent in reading their Bibles, disciples who are constantly helping their friends become Christians, disciples who are constantly serving without even being asked, without even people knowing, disciples who are consistent in serving God Almighty. That's what I'm talking about. I believe that that's what God wants and He's calling us to as we build. And so we're going to build quickly here. We have laid the foundation. You know, so long I've taken on the foundation. Because I believe that it's important. And that guy who built those, he realized how important the foundation was and he built that. However, what this guy did was he came to an hurricane zone. An area where everybody knew Obama's out with hurricanes. And he came building on the waterfront. 
as if you look there, there's sea. And that is the side facing the Atlantic. You know, in the neutral, one side is the Atlantic side, the other side the Caribbean side. The Caribbean sea side would be like this glass. But the Atlantic side, when, when the storm rage, or when those waves rage, I don't know if any of you have been to, how many of you have been to here, those ones. See, the glass will bridge. Every time I cross over that bridge, I wonder. That bridge is about at least 50 feet above the water. And when the storm comes, when the wave rises, the water rises as high as that 50 feet, knocking that bridge, destroying and going over the bridge, carrying the sand and everything over into the Caribbean seaside. That is how big that was. So this guy came, he spent a lot of time in making sure that his foundation was right. And so, even up to this day, the foundation still remains. But then he came and he did some steel frame things. With foam. Foam walls. You know what foam walls? And he's building and in his mind he's saying, oh yeah, I'm building this nice fancy structure. I'm not considering the conditions of it. And so he built this enormous fancy structure. And when the storm came, it took everything. Foundation is still left there. Because the foundation in Jesus Christ never changed. Amen. That foundation remains. This, hearing the word, believing, and becoming on the side of the baptized, don't change. God's word don't change. What will change and what will be tested is what we build. Paul said it here as we read that scripture. Paul says, everyone builds and builds on this foundation. But everything that is built will be tested. Yeah. But you know the thing about this, that some might escape. You escape like one family. <laughs> <laughs> you see a family behind you and you barely escape. But if the foundation not so guess what? You're not going to be there. You're not going to be able to be barely escaping. So he said, this guy came and he started to build. And he built this thing. And he built that enormous structure. And you know, the interesting thing was, as I said, he built, the building is done. Let me go back to my analogy with a college student. Now, what if, as a college student, I went in, did everything, registered, yeah, yeah, followed everything, paid my registration fee, but decide that, chop, I don't need to go to all my classes. I'm not going to do any tests. I fail every test. You know, you go to college and you fail all the tests. Never pass one. You don't attend, you don't attend classes. You go when you feel like it. You do what you feel like. You wake up in the morning, I don't feel like going to classes. So I stay home. You wake up in the morning, oh, I have my laundry to do, so I'm going to go to class. You wake up and you say, boy, oh, my friend, come check me. Let me go and visit my friend. I don't have to go to class. Now, at the end of your three years, will you get your diploma or your degree? Wow. You failed every test. You didn't go to class. That was the same thing with us, guys. Let's go bring it back home. Some of us, we feel like we laid the foundation. We made the right choices, you know. We studied the Bible. We made the decision in our hearts. And we did build the foundation. But then, like that, we decided, man, I don't have to come to church. I still. Man, I don't need to read my Bible. I don't need to study my books. I don't need to go to classes. These tests, I don't care if I pass or fail it. These temptations, I don't care if I resist them. I just give into them. And you fail all the tests. And you, and you say, oh, I come out with, with, with college students. I can't handle that. I'm college student. They don't, they don't have anything better to do with their time. I have better things to do. Man, I wake up and I don't feel like going to classes. Man, I wake up, I don't feel like going to church. Oh, I have no hundred to do so. Let me skip church. Let me skip Bible talk. Let me skip. And do it. And then we still want to get our reward, don't it? And when the test comes, like Paul, Paul says here, and you get tested, and you fail, and then you wonder, where's my reward? Where, I, I mean, yeah, I did bear the foundation. I did get baptized. I, 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 I made Jesus a lot of life. So what happened? You see, some of us think that just being that alone. You might, like Paul says here, what is tested? You might, you might, you know what Paul says? You might escape, but does one just escape with the flame? I don't want to just escape with the flame. 
I want when I finish, as Paul says here, I get rewarded. You know, in Jeremiah, Jesus, God says, I, the Lord, searches the mind and the heart to reward a man according to his conduct, according to what his deeds deserve. God, we, we look at our heart, our mind, to reward us according to our deeds. No deeds, no reward. No heart, no reward. You gotta have them both. And so you can't feel like, oh, I became a disciple, but not be committed. That cannot work. You can't say that, you know, I became a disciple, but I, I, I'm never, I I'm not going to study the Bible anymore. I don't know time for that. You'll never make it. You won't be rewarded. And so you got to build. You got to build, and I'm going to share quickly, these basics of building. First basic is that you got to build with prayer, continuous prayer. The Bible says pray without ceasing. Prayer is that connection that connects us to the foundation. Next, you got to pray. You got to build on the word of God. James 1.22 says, and this scripture is our theme scripture for the year as a church. It says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Our theme for this year is living the word. It's not about just hearing. It's about living it. You've got to live it. You know, in trying to wrap up here, a few more minutes, guys. I want you to turn in with me in, to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19. But this is critical. I don't want to pass, miss this. Turn to Ephesians quickly. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. You can write it down. It says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners or strict or aliens but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's also. Listen to this. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling place. So listen to this very carefully. In construction, as a surveyor, I often... If, uh, I'm called upon, and my service is called upon to lay out buildings for people. The important thing in setting out the building is that it's set to make sure that the building is square. And I said what we call control offsets. So that the builder or the contractor will be able to follow those markers I said and the offset in order to make the building square and building according to the design. It says here that Jesus is our chief cornerstone. A chief cornerstone means that everything on that building is aligned with this cornerstone. So this cornerstone directs the building that way and it directs the building that way. Make sure that the building is square. Jesus is a chief cornerstone. Our lives need to be aligned with who? Jesus. If you're going to build on your foundation, your building needs to be aligned with Jesus. In other words, if you ask yourself this question, is your relationships aligned with Jesus? You know, when you're being aligned with Jesus, you have to ask yourself the question, what would Jesus do? Because you know, when the guys, you know, I set my controls for them to build, and the cornerstone is set. If you continue to build, you know, check in, the alignment, sure enough, you're going to run off. Your building is going to be out of square. So as they build and put those blocks up, they have to keep checking the alignment with the cornerstone. Guys, as we build and as you move, you got to keep checking with Jesus. Some of us, we want to do things on our own. We feel like we know it. You know, again, in construction, I'll try to be free. Sometimes these guys call. I got to a couple calls. Oh, come and check this building for me. But a contractor refused or didn't want to. Check the alignment. You feel like, oh, I know what I'm doing. And he goes off and he does his thing. And when, at the end of the day, the building is all over the place. Some, there was one case I had to deal with where the person built the whole building on the wrong lot. Half of the building on one person, property half on the other. Why? Because the guys come and say, oh yeah, that's a boundary marker, that's a boundary marker. This must be where we are. And yes, you know. And as a result, they were up, built, cast the foundation, ready to build. And what happened? It was built wrong. Because they didn't consult. If 
felt like they know. Sometimes that's how we are. We feel like we know. We're not consulting Jesus. And so we want a relationship. And rather than say, God is my relationship in line with what you want. We go on off in our own, attempt, at, at our own direction. Do you know what we want to do? We want finances. Rather than say, God, is this the job that you want? Will this job be in line with your will for my life? No. You're going off and you're running and you do your own thing. Very often we, took, we take a career path. And we don't ask ourselves the question, God, is this career path in line with, with Jesus? Is that cornerstone? No. We go off and we do our own thing. And then, when the building is not square, and everything is going right, then we wonder, why? Oh, it was a tight building. Didn't I lay the foundation? Didn't it was a tight? So why is it that? No. And then, when you realize that you have to demolish what you started, it's going to cost you. You didn't check with God about that relationship. So you've gone on for this woman, gone on for that man. And then when you realize, oh, God, break up this thing, or I have to go try and, you know, make right. And, and you have so much invested in these things that it becomes so hard. Why? And you wonder, why God? Because it did not align with Jesus. And so we got to build and we got to be, be aligned with Jesus. And the final two things is in building. So you build with prayer, you build the word of God. You build um, having Jesus as your chief cornerstone. And here you got to do you got to build with faith and deep conviction. And finally, you got to build, well, build, the fourth one, build with great um, evangelism. I mean, you gotta be the outreach. You gotta, you gotta build, build high, build wide, and finally, you gotta build with great worship. And in John four twenty three, it says, "Yet a time is coming, and has come, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worship the Father seeks. God is spirit, and His worshippers must worship Him in spirit and in truth." We need to worship God in spirit and in truth. And guys, I just want to show this all before I do this. Let us, as we focus on our worship, worship God in spirit and in truth. Tony was talking about you worshiping God in, in spirit and in truth. Yeah, church on time. Give God, you know, I said to, 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 my, to the host church on, on, on Wednesday. God, we, we, we dedicate two hours on a Sunday morning to worship God. I said four because an hour to get ready and come, and an hour of fellowship and everything after. Right? So that's four hours out of 24 in one day to give to God. And some of us still can't come to church early. Still can't come to church on time. Still cheating God of that two hours that you dedicate to Him. And you're not willing to put things in place to make sure that you're worshiping God in spirit and in truth. That's a part of worship. Because if you don't value your worship to God enough to be at church on time, then you don't worship, you don't value your worship of God. Another thing is when we come together to begin worship and we have our fellowship. Fellowship is sweet, eh? But fellowship is not worship. Fellowship is fellowship. But when we begin to worship brothers and sisters, let us come focus to worship. Not the fellowship. At the beginning of worship service, let us be in place, sitting nice, thinking about God, fixing our minds on Jesus as we bring to worship Him. When we have our short fellowship break and we are pulled back, let us get back together, focus our minds, get back to God. Brothers and sisters, if you're going to build, you've got to build with true worship of God as a church. And our theme for the month here is on worship. Our focus will be on worship. Let us focus as we move forward in worshiping our God in spirit and in truth. Amen. And so, brothers, in closing, finally, as we worship in 2015, if you have not, have not yet laid the solid foundation in Jesus, let that be your priority as you go forward in 2015. Your priority should be to make sure that your foundation is solid. If you're not a disciple, you need to build your foundation by making Jesus Lord of your life. Get, get, get together with the person who invited you. Spend time in God's Word. 
understand how to build a solid foundation. Not everybody can. You need to know from God's word. And if you are a disciple and you are still struggling with the elementaries, you're still wondering, oh, am I saved? Listen, it means that your foundation has not been laid properly. And you need to stop and take a stop and get your foundation to where it needs to be. And then for those of us whose foundation is firm, you're firmly grounded. You have no doubt about your salvation. It's time to build and continue to build. You know, some are building. And what you're building has been tested. And have proven strong. Remain strong. And continue to build. Take it higher. Take it wider. And build a structure that will build, bring glory and honor to God. So closing, finally. Not only hear what the word says, but live the word. And to God be the glory. Amen. 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 Amen.